Welcome everyone. Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor and Pensions will come to order. Uh, I note that a quorum is present. I also note for the subcommittee that Mr. Takano of California and Mr. Jacobs of New York are permitted to participate today in today's hearing with the understanding that their questions will come only after all members of the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle who are present have had an opportunity to question the witnesses. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on examining the administration of the unemployment insurance system. This is a hybrid hearing pursuant to House Resolution 8 and the regulations there are two. All microphones both in the room and on the platform will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. When members wish to speak or seek recognition, they should unmute themselves and allow a pause of two seconds to ensure the microphone picks up their speech. I will ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members who are participating in person should not be locked onto the remote platform in order to avoid feedback, echoes, and distortion. Members participating remotely will be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera, and they should be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this is if they are experiencing technical difficulty and inform committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted, and use your phone to immediately call a committee IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair need to step away for any reason, another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel of the chair's absence. In order to ensure that the committee's five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time using the committee's digital timer and will be uh, broadcast in the committee room on the te television monitor. The committee room timer will not, will not be in use. Uh, members are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Finally, while recent guidance from the Office of Attending Physician has made mask wearing optional at this time, Please know that we have in our midst at both the member and the staff levels, individuals who are immunocompromised and or have immediate family members who are immunocompromised as well, who are not or who are not vaccinated either due to medical reasons or because the vaccine is not yet available to children under six months of age. Therefore, the committee strongly recommends that masks continue to be worn out of concern for the safety of unvaccinated or immunocompromised committee members and staff and their families. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate, adequate time to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thanks again, everyone, our panelists, members uh, for joining us. Today, we are meeting to discuss the importance of the unemployment insurance system and steps the Department of Labor and Congress can take to make improvements of the administration of the system. Since 1935, the unemployment insurance or UI system has helped millions of Americans who have lost their jobs support themselves and their families until they can find new employment. This social safety net is particularly important during times of economic downturns like the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, COVID-19 caused record unemployment. During the first week of March, 2020, there were fewer than 300,000 initial UI claims. By the last week of March, 2020, there were more than 6 million new UI benefit claims. That's 300,000 to 6 million within just a few weeks. In response to the pandemic, and the record unemployment, Congress passed the CARES Act, which among other actions created three new temporary UI benefit programs to expand the state's capacity to provide UI benefits to workers. The CARES Act UI programs undoubtedly helped to prevent the county's, country's economic collapse 
supported 53 million workers and put over $870 billion back into the economy. In fact, according to the Government Accountability Office, the expansion of unemployment programs during adverse times such as COVID-19 created overall economic stability, prevented detrimental outcomes from worsening, and had limited effects on workers' incentives to return to work. Unfortunately, the implementation of these programs in conjunction with the historic surge in the UI benefit claims exasperated many of the longstanding challenges and in inequities in the UI system. For example, people with limited internet access, people with disabilities, people with limited English proficiency, and other marginalized communities faced steeper barriers to assessing, assessing their benefits, accessing their benefits. While the UI system is a critical program that has helped millions of workers in our economy during tough times, Congress should examine the challenges of the system that were made much worse by the pandemic to help improve the administration of the UI system. These improvements would help to better serve workers and employers before the next economic downturn. When I was in the California State Legislature, I was chair of the Labor Committee during the Great Recession, and we had many challenges. We worked with the Republican administration to try to, in a bipartisan way, make the system more efficient and understand that there were ebbs and flows to the economy and we should be prepared for challenges like the Great Recession and the pandemic. The Department of Labor needs additional resources to help protect the integrity of the UI system like strengthening its fraud prevention measure to stop fraud by sophisticated criminal syndicates. We must provide states with resources to address the gaps in their UI system, their technological infrastructure to prevent improper payments and fraud to ensure better service delivery and improve access to the UI system, especially when states must meet an increased demand for UI benefits during these economic downturns. And finally, to address longstanding inequities and barriers to access to the UI system, the department and state agencies should proactively eliminate barriers and expand UI access for all workers, including those who historically been ineligible to receive UI benefits. To help implement these reforms, the Department of Labor used funding from the American Rescue Plan to create the Office of unemployment insurance modernization. I'm impressed by the work the office has completed to date, particularly in ensuring more equitable distribution of benefits. Thank you again to our witnesses, and I look forward to discussing how we can improve the administration of the UI system, which remains an invaluable backstop for both workers and our economy. I would now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member for the purpose of his opening statement. Mr. Allen, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this uh, hearing, very important hearing today. Um, obviously, because of COVID-19, the, the pandemic, uh, we had economic shutdowns, and the na nation experienced historic levels of uh, unemployment job loss. In response, Congress created three new federally funded temporary unemployment insurance programs under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act called the CARES Act, which was uh, bipartisan legislation. Uh, this legislation temporarily expanded eligibility, increased benefits, and extended benefit duration. Uh, Democrats chose to continue to pay expanded benefits under the expensive and partisan American Rescue Plan Act, Recognizing that the vast majority of Americans had the opportunity to return to work, Republicans fought against this extension, and Democrats ignored our concerns. What were the consequences of this unnecessary continuation of these expanded benefits? Record unemployment payouts and fewer workers returning to work. In fact, we've all been in our districts over the August work period, and we see wanted, help wanted signs everywhere. Uh, which highlights this very, very critical issue. During the 18 months between March 2020 and September 21, the expanded unemployment program costs, or UI program costs, approximately an astounding $900 billion, almost a trillion dollars. 
That is more debt on the backs of our children and grandchildren. More unemployment checks were sent out in this 18-month period than were paid out across the six years during and following the Great Recession. Republicans resisted ARPA's extension of benefits because of the perverse incentives it created. Two-thirds of those who collected increased unemployment benefits under the CARES Act earned more than when they were working. And the federal government pays people more money not to work than they were making while employed. Uh, most people choose to stay home or drop out of the workforce. While Democrats argue that this expansion should become permanent, Republicans completely disagree. The expansion of these uh, uh, unemployment or UI programs was meant to be a robust but temporary change to the unemployment system during an unprecedented emergency. The president himself has de declared that COVID is over and it's time to re return the UI system back to normal operations. Get people back to work. Unemployment insurance is supposed to provide a temporary safety net for workers between jobs. We do not need another welfare system. Under this massive expansion, widespread fraud occurred in the UI system. The fraud has been so rampant that the Government Accountability Office has put DOL and the UI system on its high-risk list. According to DOL's own Office of Inspector General, OIG, potential fraud payments could be as high or even higher than $186 billion as of March 2022. According to the Washington Post, only $4 billion of these fraudulent claims have been reco recovered. Nonetheless, the Biden administration issued guidance allowing states to ignore suspicious overpayments and to excuse DOL from reporting fraudulent overpayments and amounts recovered. The Biden administration should be assisting states recover should assist states to recover stolen money, not putting roadblocks in their way or encouraging them to ignore fraudulent behavior. The OIG regularly reports on specific examples of fraud it detects. In one recent case, a man attempted to defraud the Illinois Department of Employment Security of more than $4 million in state and federal unemployment insurance by stealing the identities of elderly Illinois residents. He then laundered the UI checks by purchasing salvaged automobiles that he and his co-conspirators then shipped to Nigeria. It was even reported that in California, the state approved millions of dollars that went to prisoners, exposing further vulnerabilities in our unemployment system. DOL and state UI systems struggled to process claims, implement new programs, and provide adequate customer service to states and claimants. There are clearly major shortcomings in the system that must be addressed. The bottom line is DOL and states must make significant reforms to their implementation of the UI system. GAO gave DOL 21 recommendations and it is yet to implement any of those recommendations. The American Rescue Plan Act included $2 billion for DOL to address the administration of the UI system and Republicans want to ensure that the Biden administration is spending that money wisely. We must demand transparency and accountability. The mistakes made during the pandemic should not be repeated, and taxpayers should never again be cheated out of billions of dollars. In closing, President Biden even said that the pandemic is over, as I stated earlier. So it's time we stop funneling even more taxpayer dollars into a flawed system. And in fact, we, you know, we don't know, well, there, there are no pay for us here. In order for our workforce to reach pre-pandemic levels, we must ensure that unemployment insurance only serves as a bridge for people to find a job and lift themselves up. We should focus on policies that will spur economic growth and give folks the opportunity to do what God created them to do. I look forward to hearing your testimonies. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Appreciate that perspective. Look forward to working with you as always on remedies. Uh, without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on October 5th.
I'm now happy to introduce and uh, thank our witnesses. Uh, first, Mr. Thomas Costa is a director in the U.S. Government Accountability Office, or GAO's Education Workforce and Income Security Team. He oversees worker protection, uh, safety, employment, and training issue. Mr. Costa joined GAO in 2005. Ms. Rebecca Dixon, Ms. Rebecca Dixon is the executive director of the National Employment Law Project, or NELP. Uh, she has an expertise in occupational um, segregation, program management, unemployment, insurance, and workplace equity issues. Ms. Dixon joined NELP in 2010. Mr. Matt Weidinger is a senior fellow and Rose Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Ms. Veronica Robinson is a private citizen who was born and raised in Philadelphia. She is a member, she is a mother of two sons and a lifelong worker with experience in a variety of industries, including her work as a classroom assistant in the Philadelphia School District, as a home health aide, and as an ambassador for the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Authority or SEPTA. Ms. Robinson lost her job with SEPTA at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, we really appreciate the witnesses for participating today. Look forward to your perspective and your testimony. Uh, let me remind the witnesses that we uh, have read your written statements and they will appear in, in full in the hearing record. Uh, pursuant to committee rule 8D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to five minutes, a summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. During your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and the timer will be visible to you at the witness table. Please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. We will let all the witnesses make their presentation before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. The witness is aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee, and therefore we will proceed with their testimony. Let me first recognize Mr. Costa. Mr. Costa, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Desaigne, Republican Leader Allen, Chairman Scott, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the challenges and risks facing the unemployment insurance system. The federal government and states work together to manage the UI programs. States design and administer their own UI programs, while the Department of Labor oversees states' compliance with federal requirements. However, the UI system has faced long-standing challenges with service delivery and program integrity, which worsened during the COVID pandemic. In June, we added the UI system to our high-risk list because we found these challenges pose significant risks to, U to UI service delivery and expose the system to significant financial loss. Moving forward, it will be important for labor to take a coordinated and sustained approach involving state and federal stakeholders, including Congress, to ensure significant progress in improving the UI system's performance and integrity. My testimony is based on our June reports, which examined issues including First, challenges related to the UI system's ability to respond to the needs of unemployed workers. Two, actions needed to address key risks facing the system. Three, potential options for transforming the system. And four, the economic effects of expanding UI benefits during adverse times. First, we found that the UI system faces challenges involving its program design. Because each state designs its own UI program, there are 53 state programs that differ by benefit amounts, duration of benefit periods, and eligibility rules. These differences have contributed to declining access, inconsistent levels of support, and disparities in benefit distribution. For example, prior to COVID, the proportion of unemployed workers filing for UI benefits was near a historic low, dropping from 55% in 1958 to 28% in 2019. The reasons for this drop include state restrictions on eligibility, as well as the lack of coverage for workers who are not traditionally covered by UI, such as gig workers, self-employed workers, and independent contractors. In addition to challenges around eligibility, we and others found racial and ethnic disparities in the receipt of benefits. In particular, in two of the four states we selected for our study, we found significant disparities 
and the benefit approval rates for black, American Indian, and Hispanic claimants, with approval rates sometimes half that of white claimants. We also found that states face challenges in providing customer service, delivering timely benefits, implementing the new pandemic programs, and using and modernizing their IT systems. For example, during the pandemic, some, um, some unemployed workers experienced long waits for benefits, which caused financial and other hardship. And states were overwhelmed by record levels of UI claims as they simultaneously implemented the new pandemic programs. In addition, many states were reliant on legacy IT systems that were underfunded, inefficient, and lacked all the necessary capabilities to detect improper payments and fraud. Second, we identified a number of steps that labor is taking to address the risks facing the UI system, including sending technical assistance teams to states and offering UI-related grants. However, additional action is needed. We made five new recommendations in our three UI reports in June and have a total of 21 open UI recommendations, including that labor develop and execute a transformation plan that outlines actions to address effective service delivery and mitigate financial risk. Labor generally agreed with our recommendations, and we think it is critical that labor implement our and related inspector general recommendations. We also convened a panel of stakeholders with UI expertise to identify options for transforming the system. Panelists had a wide variety of suggestions, including changes to program design to better target support, improvements to IT systems, and ways to enhance program integrity. These suggestions are detailed in my written testimony and our related report. Lastly, although the system faces many challenges, we found the expansion of UI programs during adverse times, such as the 2007-2009 recession, in the COVID pandemic helped to stabilize the economy, prevented detrim detrimental outcomes from worsening, and had limited effect on the return to work. In conclusion, it is critical to address the challenges and risks facing the UI system. Given the important role it plays in supporting unemployed workers and stabilizing the economy during economic downturns, labor has started taking some actions to address our recommendations, but that alone will not be enough. Labor also needs to continue to work in partnership with the states and also with Congress to address both service delivery and program integrity. This completes my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Costa, so much. Uh, I'll now recognize Ms. Dixon for five minutes. Ms. Dixon, you are recognized. Good morning, Chairman Dosonier, Ranking Member Allen, and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Rebecca Dixon, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project. NELP is a nonprofit research, policy, and capacity building organization that for more than 50 years has sought to strengthen protections and build power for workers in the United States, including those who are unemployed. Unemployment insurance programs played a crucial role during the pandemic as a lifeline, not only for unemployed workers and their families, but for entire communities, businesses both small and large, and the nation's economy as a whole. Unemployment benefits enabled 4.7 million people to avoid poverty in 2020 and 2.3 million in 2021, in particular by covering workers who traditionally would be ineligible for UI, an estimated 1.1 million black workers and 1.2 million Latino workers and their families avoided poverty in 2020. Before I go any further, let me lay to rest one pernicious untruth about pandemic UI benefits. These programs did not cause worker shortages. The GAO conducted an extensive literature review of other, over 30 recent empirical studies, including those comparing states that cut off benefits prematurely, and all of those studies demonstrated that UI benefits had limited to no effect on workers returning to work. Collectively, the pandemic unemployment programs covered additional workers who wouldn't have received benefits, including those in occupations disproportionately occupied by women, people of color, older workers, and people with disabilities. They provided much needed extra weeks of benefits to all, but particularly to black men who experienced notably longer durations of unemployment than their white counterparts. And they made up for extremely low benefits in states that have high proportions of black and Latino workers, which tend to pay the lowest benefits in the nation. Despite the substantial advances toward equity in pandemic UI compared to regular UI, GAO details that white workers have far more success accessing pandemic UI benefits than black workers, just as they do in the regular benefit program. As we all know, we all know that many workers had to wait months, weeks, even longer to receive UI benefits that they were entitled to 
And this was because even before the pandemic struck, virtually every state was working with antiquated technology systems, deficient staffing and resources. For the past 40 years, Congress has either level funded or decreased funding for UI administration, including a 21% decline in the decade leading up to the pandemic. The $2 billion in funding that Congress provided as part of the American Rescue Plan for DOL to improve UI delivery was a critical first step, but only that. DOL is off to a good start with those funds for equity grants, tiger teams, and claimant experience pilot programs and a navigator pilot program. But DOL and the state UI programs need increased and sustained funding and staffing if they are to function as they should. DOL and Congress must also do what they can to mandate and ensure that UI applications, websites, and materials aren't needlessly complex and confusing, that they are translated into sufficient languages to reach states' populations of workers, that UI websites are optimized for use on mobile devices. And all technology updates must be done with the worker experience at the center and making sure that these sites are optimized for a good user experience. Many of the same factors that undermine an equitable access also make the UI system an appealing target for organized crime during the pandemic. The spike in fraudulent UI claims during the pandemic was primarily the result of criminal enterprises engaging in identity theft fraud. The system was particularly vulnerable given the age, need of new UI benefits and haste, and the inadequate staffing levels in offices across the country. Congress can remedy these problems by appropriating sufficient funds to all states to have and maintain adequate technology, staff, and to authorize more effective permanent UI programs for times of economic emergency so that they can be pre-programmed and ready to go and not have to be built from scratch every time there's a crisis. Congress and Department of Labor must also ensure that states appropriately balance equitable, timely access to benefits for eligible workers, with the need to prevent and detect improper payments and fraud. Passing the recently introduced Guaranteeing Unemployment Assistance and Reducing Deception Act by Congressman Horsford would help to achieve this goal and balance mandating uh, DOL to set new performance standards in key areas for access. Workers deserve access to UI, whether the entire economy has shut down or just their workplace and where they used to be employed. But there is a particular urgency to fix UI before the next recession takes hold. Congress must learn from the experience and build on the success of pandemic unemployment benefits while also securing the system's failing infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Whiting for five minutes. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Sonier, Ranking Member Allen, Chairman Scott, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before the subcommittee this morning. My name is Matt Whitinger, and I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I previously worked for two decades for the House Ways and Means Committee, including for a number of years as the staff director of the subcommittee having a jurisdiction over the nation's unemployment insurance system. I'll make three points, basically summarizing my written testimony. First, Congress, on a bipartisan basis and with good intentions, legislated a massive benefits response to the pandemic, which actually increased the administrative strains on the system. Second, those strains made the system more vulnerable to enormous fraud that we've witnessed. And third, Congress has since taken steps that help minimize that abuse, and those and other measures should be built into the continued response to this crisis and future recessions. First off, starting in March of 2020, Congress responded to the unfolding pandemic with unprecedented federal benefit expansions, which uh, several members have discussed, including $600 per week supplements and an entirely new program benefiting millions of individuals never before eligible for unemployment checks. State and federal claims quickly rose to a record 33 million in June of 2020. In all, over the entire span of federal programs, 1.6 billion weeks of unemployment checks were paid. Um, well, and while temporary federal programs uh, were in operation, that cost federal taxpayers, just federal taxpayers, $700 billion. For someone collecting just average weekly UI benefits, state and federal benefits could reach a total of $46,000. That highlights both the record support available to unemployed Americans, and, as well as the enormous target that criminals uh, saw for fraud. State agencies were faced with two crises at once, responding to the massive surge in demand for regular state unemployment benefits, while also standing up these new federal programs for millions of additional recipients. My second point is those strains and, the key, and key federal program features contributed to the fraud inflicted on the system. The new PUA program has proved especially problematic. It offered benefits to millions never before eligible for state UI benefits or known to state UI agencies. Program features like allowing individuals to self-certify their eligibility and not requiring proof of prior work or even confirmation of identification um, made it highly vulnerable to abuse. 
Criminals pounced on those vulnerabilities, and as a result, we saw a massive and still only partially understood uh, increase in fraud. The Department of Labor has reported that an improper payment rate of 18.7%, but that understates likely, true likely misspending. First, it omits the enormous spike in both spending and likely fraud at the start of the pandemic, and second, it doesn't include the elevated improper payments under the PUA program, which was the most abused by almost all accounts. Citing just the 18.7% rate, the Department of Labor's Inspector General testified in March that at least $163 billion could have been paid improperly with a significant portion attributable to fraud. Other experts estimate losses could reach $400 billion and arguably constituting the greatest theft of tax dollars in US history. For a sense of scale, $163 billion is the equivalent of all UI program spending in six typical non-recessionary years. My third point is that while initially slow to react, Congress has taken steps to address the biggest loopholes. Bipartisan December 2020 legislation required new PUA claimants to provide proof of prior employment, and states were required to verify the identity of claimants. Those changes were followed by rapid declines in initial claims for PUA benefits. In New York State, for example, PUA claims dropped by a stunning 92% after anti-fraud initiatives were implemented. Those and other program integrity features like matching against databases of prisoners, new hires, and those claiming benefits in other states should be standard practice. There's much left to do. Only a tiny fraction of the misspent money has been recovered. Unfortunately, given the international criminal organizations behind many attacks, much will pro likely prove unrecoverable. But policymakers should also recognize that states have little incentive to recover misspent federal funds. Legislation to overcome that disincentive would allow states to retain 25% of any recoveries of misspent federal pandemic funds, which states could then devote to modernizing their systems. That offers potential gains for rightful recipients and taxpayers alike. The Biden administration included $2 billion for system modernization in the American Rescue Plan, some of which is devoted to improving program integrity. Congress should ask hard questions about the enduring results of those one-time efforts while conducting a thorough evaluation of the long-term administrative financing needs of this system. Preventing a repeat of the pandemic fraud we just witnessed will require dedicated and consistent effort from both state and federal officials. But in the end, deserving recipients and the taxpayers that support this system will be the greatest beneficiaries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony and agree with much of it. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, Ms. Robinson, you are recognized for five minutes. go now? <laughs> yes, floor is yours, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Veronica Robinson. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today to talk to you about my experience with unemployment during the time of the pandemic. During the time of the pandemic, early February, I started a new job. And by the time of the end of March, I was laid off of that job due to the pandemic. I tried to apply for regular unemployment because of um, I had just started that job and it wasn't uh, any time in. I was not able to get into unemployment. And so I was able to find out about Facebook Live of you know, filled up the legal assistance with Ms. Julia, given information on how to apply for the PA program, which I had no knowledge about at that time. I tuned into that Facebook Live with her and gained a lot of knowledge and important information. I applied to uh, legal aid, uh, for legal aid assistance for help. And I got Ms. Julia, she was able to help me a great deal during this time of all the challenges that I faced, which were quite a bit. I filed for the PA program, but I had to do it on my, my cell phone, which is a very difficult task to get done. The format is for a bigger screen, like a laptop or a computer, and I just had my, my cell phone. There was a lot of things, the way things were worded that were sometimes would trick you up and mis misleading the format itself. It's hard to you know cheat that on, on a cell phone. So it was difficult, but eventually I got through it with the help of Ms. Julius, help from uh, Philadelphia Legal Assistance. Um, got the, the application submitted and she had someone from uh, the UA program to get me caught up because by that time I had fell behind with my weeks. Then the fall of 2020 happened. I had some fall issues that were on my account when I was going over some transactions, which I normally did to keep track of my 
by spending and everything. I saw something that didn't look right. So I called the US bank card and talked to a customer service person, which informed me that there was some fraudulent uh, transactions on my accounts that happened outside the US. Uh, he asked me, well, had I ever been outside the US? Did I know anyone? And I, I did not, and I've never been outside the US. So he informed me that they would do an investigation, but assured me that I would get my $2,000 back once the investigation was completed. And it would take about at least a month or so. So during that time, they had to deactivate my card. Um, they said they would send a new card. I waited on that card, but it didn't show up. So I contacted Miss Julia and she looked into it and got the card sent to me. I was able to get back into my account to be able to access the money that I still had there. But it did put a strain on me because I, you know, still needs to get things on a weekly basis. So eventually um, they got done the investigation and returned my $2,000 to me. By that time I had fell behind because I wasn't able to continue on with the, the weekly um, benefits. Ms. Julia got the lady from uh, PDJ program to get back in touch with me and catch me back up again. So that was a, a great deal of help. By um, the spring of 2021, I believe, I was doing my weekly one week and there was this weird question that came up asking about my citizenship all of a sudden. And I couldn't understand why, but it wouldn't give me the option to say I was a citizen. It kept giving some other weird uh, options. So I contacted Ms. Julia and she looked into it and found out there was a glitch, some sort of glitch in the program that it was affecting other people just as well as it was affecting me. Another, another issue that came up with the PDA program. So I, I faced many challenges during that time, you know, not being able to get to my funds, uh, fraud, and, and uh, the, the format itself, the way things are set up with unemployment, they really, I think it would be beneficial if they tried to make it more simpler. Uh, not only the process, but the wording of the questions and things that they ask. But I am really thankful for the PDA at that time. It was a life-saving source of income for me because I was not able to work. No one was really, you know, very few people, only those that had uh, certain jobs at that time. But um, I look forward to trying to, you know, help with anything that I can to make the system better. And I thank you for this opportunity today to be a part of this process. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. We really appreciate your testimony and um, your personal experience is invaluable for the Congress to hear about. Uh, members, under Committee Rule 9A, we will now question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I will be recognizing subcommittee members in seniority order. Again, to ensure that members' five minutes rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time. Please be attentive to the time. Wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. I now would recognize myself for five minutes and start with Mr. Costa. Thank you, Mr. Costa, for your um, comments and your work in this field. We, I look forward to working with you and the ranking member to see if we can make this system sustainable. Uh, for the next time we need to ramp up. In California, um, having spent a lot of time on criminal justice reform, uh, the largest uh, inmate population in the country, um, because we're the largest state, but also because of three strikes laws, the legislative analyst office told us and the Supreme Court had ordered us to um, take a quarter of our prisoners and get them out of um, the prisons they were in, many of whom I have visited. So one of the key things I'm worried about is how prisoners in the California Corrections Department um, was, were able to access and be examples of fraud. How can we help states like California to identify this and prevent fraud and also do it in a cost-effective way? During the recession with, the, with Governor Schwarzenegger, our LAO actually told us that we were spending too much money on fraud prevention, uh, given what the scale was. So getting this right is important, and I think we can do this in a bipartisan way. Could you tell us what you can recommend uh, to avoid this fraud in the future, particularly for this population? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the prisoners were, were able to access the, the program because of, of insufficient controls in, in the state's system. So there was not enough um, data matching and the system didn't have the capacity to do the data matching they needed to do, uh, which was not unique to California. There were a number of states that struggled with um, having systems that were up to date enough that they could handle some of the data matching to detect improper payments and fraud. Um, the Department of Labor did work out an agreement last October with the Social Security Administration to get access to prisoner records so that they can do better data matching and make that accessible to the states. Um, but we, as I alluded to before, a number of states simply don't have the IT systems in place that can manage some of these uh, data matching. So it's important that the states uh, get the funding and support and that contribute themselves uh, to improve those systems. The, the federal government is generally supportive of the administrative side of the, the, the state systems while the states actually implement and deliver benefits. Mr. Costa, I um, really appreciate that. Did you look at uh, minimum caseloads? Uh, during the recession, a bill I'm very proud of authoring that passed into law, we required in that instance mortgage servicers to have minimum caseloads so we could manage the service providers better, and it really helped us with all, with the, the recession in that instance of private um, service providers. Could we do the same thing for states? Have evidence-based research what the, what the role, what the minimum caseloads should be for efficiency for um, for workers in the UI system? Um, we we didn't look specifically at that, sir, but we did hear repeatedly that there were not enough workers. So we, we saw you know, tremendous increases in the workload for, um, for uh, state workers who were managing uh, the UI systems and, and handling those cases. In many states, they had to bring in um, workers from other parts of the state government or, or even the, um, the military uh, to help manage claims. And in, in most cases, those folks needed training. And the training, the systems are complex and unique to each state. And so that training can take weeks or sometimes months. Uh, so while we were in the pandemic, we didn't have that kind of time. And so I think we saw a lot of mistakes were being made and a lot of challenges for, for people who were trying to access their benefits. I appreciate it, Mr. Costa. One of our challenges with the UI in California is we have a progressive revenue stream. A lot of our revenue comes from capital gains on uh, successful, wealthy individuals, uh, and that ebbs and flows in, in inverse proportion to the economy. So uh, Governor Brown, Governor Newsom appropriately uh, put more money in the reserves, but it still isn't sufficient. Ms. Dixon, um, in my view, um, I'd like to ask you to describe appropriate balance between uh, preventing fraud, uh, making the system have integrity, and ensuring that the claimants can receive timely benefits. I've got a lot of stories about people like Ms. Robinson um, trying to access and getting frustrated and giving up. Could you respond to that? Sure. Um, we definitely have seen an increase in focus on eligibility fraud, and the Department of Labor dis discriminates between eligibility fraud and identity fraud, identity theft fraud. And so the fraud that we saw in the pandemic was primarily identity theft fraud. In the regular program, it's relatively uh, uncommon. And so one of the things that Congress could do is stand up these programs in advance so that there's not this rush to do quick programming because in the regular program, the time has been taken to put in place things that prevent fraud. And so we need to be careful not to overcorrect for this by putting in place things like um, facial recognition, um, identification uh, that really do thwart workers. And, you know, we know that facial recognition is not as accurate for black or Native American workers. So really making sure that we balance, um, making sure we get benefits paid in a timely manner. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, appreciate uh, the responses to my questions. Uh, my time is up. Before yielding to the ranking member, I would like to submit for the record a statement from Ms. Julia Simon Michael. Um, a supervising attorney with the Philadelphia Legal Assistance who helped Ms. Robinson with her PUI benefits. Um, her statement connects Ms. Robinson's experience to the broader, broader uh, 
uh, issues within the system and the unemployment insurance system. I now recognize the ranking member for the purposes of his questioning the witnesses. Mr. Allen, the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, we've known for some time that uh, particularly at 2002, the last time we balanced our federal budget, we had a labor participation rate in this country of 67%, and it has de declined substantially uh, since, since then. It, it was uh, uh, actually at a low of 62.7% in 2018. It ticked up in 2020 uh, about three points, and of course, uh, the uh, participation rate during COVID dropped to 60%. And as of August of this year, it's back up about two percentage points. Uh, Mr. Whittinger, you explained in your testimony that state and federal benefits could have reached 46,000 for an individual collecting national average weekly unemployment benefit between April 1, 2020 and September 6, 2021. Did individuals receiving unemployment benefits collect more in unemployment than they earned while working? And why should policymakers be wary of implementing a UI system with benefits that exceed prior earnings, particularly when we have a declining workforce in this country and the alarm bells are going off? Thank you, Congressman. The answer to your question is yes. Uh, studies suggest that while the $600 supplement was payable, as many as two-thirds of all recipients of unemployment benefits received more in benefits than they earned previously while working. That later dropped to $300 per week uh, for a number of weeks uh, in late 2020 and throughout the uh, first part of 2021. Even at $300 a week, about 40% of recipients continue to receive more in benefits than they earned while working. So uh, that is, um, that's quite contrary to the, the historic nature of the UI system, which is designed to provide partial, partial wage replacement. And that's, you know, that exists for a whole number of reasons, but including to provide an incentive for individuals to go to back to work. The nature of the program is to provide people the wherewithal to search for new jobs after they're laid off through no fault of their own. Um, the system has never before provided anything close to complete or even more than complete wage replacement for individuals. A system that does so, um, especially outside of the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic, which is why the $600 benefit was initially uh, designed, really um, risks, it, it invites trouble. Um, it, the, the problems include lengthier stays on unemployment, atrophying skills for workers, increasing mismatch when people go back to work, um, labor shortages, all those sorts of things. Right. Well, obviously we need to address this, you know, the workforce shortage in this country. We've known about it declining for some time. COVID exacerbated uh, the situation. Uh, Mr. Whittinger, on the American Rescue Plan Act, have made uh, about $2 billion available for DOL to fix the UI system. Uh, what sh steps should DOL take to make uh, life hard on the fraudsters and easy for legitimate claimants? Uh, have you looked into that, and is DOL making the reforms you think are needed? Sure. Um, DOL, in short, I think should work with the states to prevent the things that were the biggest problems that we just witnessed. So um, some of those involve identity theft, they involve things like matching against obvious databases like prisoners, that shouldn't be optional as uh, was suggested by um, the administration's regulation in October of last year. It should be mandatory. There's no reason that states should have the option not to match their benefit databases against prisoner roles. Um, yeah, how did, how did states legally do that? Um, well, California, among I think more than a dozen states, actually opted to not do that. So yeah. um, there was research, I believe, in around 2016, 2017, that found something like two thirds of the states did that sort of matching. And the matching is not perfect, right? These databases are are not necessarily complete, but there's something. And at the very least, states should be matching their state databases of benefits against state inmates. Um, but even states were not doing that. So in California, that resulted in. Attorney Generals wrote a letter in November of 2020 that suggested that a billion dollars, mostly federal money, because that was mostly the money that was going to the system, had been lost to prisoners claiming benefits in California alone. Uh, other studies found that $42 million of California money had been paid to inmates in other states. So, you know, some of it boils down to will, much of it boils down to administrative capacity, but the, the long and short of this is, these systems should be able to do both. They should be able to serve deserving recipients while making sure that individuals who should not be collecting benefits are not. Um, that's, uh, I, mean, it, it, I mean, it's hard. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, can you? I mean, it, 
and, and you know, what we're trying to do is help those who need help. And uh, boy, did, did, did this thing get out of hand. Thank you, Mr. Whitmer, and I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, I have been notified that one of our witnesses would like to take a short break. So I would ask committee staff, uh, we're only gonna do five minutes um, to accommodate the witness request. So I'll ask committee staff to start the timer for five minutes and we will uh, recess just for five minutes to accommodate the witness.
All right, we're going to count back in. Four, three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. I hope our witnesses are all feeling better and we will proceed. I'll now rank the gentleman from the great state of Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, for five minutes. Mr. Courtney, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for holding this hearing and to the witnesses. I think this is a really important event to really get best practices and learn uh, the best lessons uh, in terms of the experience our country just went through. Ms. Dixon, in your testimony, you described some of the ways Congress stepped up to provide more workers unemployment insurance during the pandemic. One of the provisions in the Bipartisan CARES Act was to provide 100% federal reimbursement for shared work arrangements. The shared work or work share program allows workers to receive partial unemployment benefits when their employer has reduced their hours. Essentially, it allows the employer to keep workers and the workers also to keep connected to their jobs, even when they cannot continue to pay or receive full-time wages. Um, in Connecticut, which is one of the 26 states that has shared work, uh, for those employers who know about it and workers who know about it, it's a very popular uh, program. Unfortunately, um, there's about 1% participation because of lack of awareness and because the system is all manual. It, it takes 30 days to, to process uh, getting involved in this. And I guess, you know, in terms of, um, you know, one of the lessons from what we just went through uh, and, and one of the hopefully um, initiatives from USDOL is to really boost awareness and also um, speed up, you know, the, the, the ability of, of firms to, to use this arrangement, which again is kind of commonplace in Europe. I was wondering if you could sort of talk about that a little bit. Sure, thank you for the question. So this program is really an untapped resource. Um, there's no reason why it can't be uh, available for all 50 states and widely used when there's an economic downturn. Um, we know that when people lose their jobs, the, most of those are permanent and they become disconnected. And there, so there's so many benefits to this program. So one of the things that um, I'm aware of is that Department of Labor is working to automate the process to make it easier for employers to take advantage of that program. And that should help with the uptake in addition to all of the ways in which um, Congress has tried to incentivize this for employers to take advantage of it. Well, thank you. I mean, anecdotally, I mean, what I've heard um, you know, on the ground was just that um, the, the reemployment rate was much faster and higher when people were part, you know, in a shared work program. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll take that lesson to heart uh, moving forward. Um, you know, there's been some discussion about the American Rescue Plan funding um, that um, is, again, trying to help uh, U.S. Or, or departments of labor to sort of um, size up and speed up. Um, their process in terms of fraud and prevention detection. Um, Connecticut is one of the states that uh, participated in the Tiger Teams initiative, which is one of the ARP-funded uh, programs, which, um, again, was about really trying to boost detection of fraud. And I, I just have a quick statement from uh, the administrator of the program, uh, which, again, was funded through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, the initiative established uh, the Connecticut Department of Labor's integrity warehouse and data flow to prevent and detect bad actor unemployment activities. This invaluable technology project allowed CTDOL to identify 30,000 bad actor claims within six weeks of going live and prevented unemployment insurance payments to criminals. As CTDOL and its customers benefit from this initiative, we'll be preparing for additional Tiger Team concepts and expansions without a doubt a very positive experience and one that provides an amazing return on investment. Again, Mr. Costa, you referred to, again, some of the, the initiatives in ARP, uh, and this obviously is feedback along with many others, uh, which we've heard uh, good results from. And is that, again, the type of practice that we wanna see kind of become sustainable and long-term? Uh, yeah, we were uh, very heartened to see the work of the Tiger teams. They, they are going out to, uh, I think, eventually all the states, um, but they're, they're addressing a number of issues, both on the technology side as well as the equity side and customer service side. So looking at a whole host of problems that many states encountered during the pandemic and even before the pandemic. So I think it's a positive step. Um, there is more to be done. I think this is going to be a long-term process. One of our concerns is that the, the Department of Labor's modernization office is supposed to be temporary in nature, and we think it probably needs to be a more permanent, at least you know, it's gonna be around, we're gonna have problems for a long time. It's gonna take a long time to address these issues. No, and I, I think um, that's the purpose of this hearing is to really find ways to, to keep, 
you know, the, the best practices um, moving forward. However, I mean, now it, at least with Tiger teams, there's sort of a, a, a knowledge reservoir that's building up. And, and again, I think that's gonna provide a sustainability of its own. I, we hope so as well. And one of our recommendations was that the department uh, look at lessons learned, uh, both on the customer service side to help states with that, but also to plan for a future crisis so that we don't start from ground zero of the next crisis, and hopefully those Tiger teams can help lay some groundwork to, to set that up. Great, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Uh, I now recognize the distinguished ranking member from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Weidinger, the Washington Post reported that a mere four billion of the estimated 163 billion in misspent unemployment benefits have been recovered as of March 2022. This is less than 2.5% of benefits that were misspent. Meanwhile, in February 2022, the Biden DOL issued guidance allowing states to apply blanket waivers to forego recovery of overpayments. Given the staggering amount of misspent taxpayer dollars, is this DOL guidance appropriate or responsible? Well, so there are significant concerns that the waivers are overly broad and will result in significant fraud being forgiven. If you actually read this Department of Labor guidance, it goes to state errors. When states paid benefits to individuals despite their telling the state that they were not searching for work, when states overpaid somebody despite the individual providing them information that suggested they should have been paid too little. That's part of the, the broader discussion here, that the administrative side of this system is not capable of handling some of the most elemental uh, ways of determining eligibility for benefits. Um, and so embedded in especially many of those PUA benefit payments and waivers of recovery of misspent uh, PUA dollars are all of these concerns that the wrong individuals got benefits. So if you waive the recovery, you could be waiving recovery for individuals who defrauded the system to get on in the first place. So I think that's the nature of the concern about the, the waivers. Um, but there's a broader concern uh, behind all of this, and that is that under the way the system operates today, states really have very little financial incentive to go after this pandemic, especially federal, misspending in the first place. Because if they do, they're gonna spend state administrative time, resources, hire investigators and all that. If they recover federal dollars, they pass those immediately on to the federal government. So there are proposals that have been introduced in Congress that, that change that dynamic that say, of the federal pandemic misspent money, if states recover some, some of it, they get to keep some of that to improve their own systems. And that obviously has promise for both benefit recipients and also taxpayers in terms of promoting more recovery of the misspent money. Thank you, Mr. Weidinger. In December 2021, the White House stated the improper payment rate in the federal state unemployment insurance program totaled 18.71% from July 2020 to June 2021. This is roughly five to eight percentage points higher than during a normal 12-month period. Is this White House estimate accurate or is it understated and why? It's accurate as far as it goes, but it misses a whole lot. And the White House statement actually admits exactly that. So it omits, omits several things. First, it starts in July of 2020. Um, the months before that saw the peak in terms of claims and benefits being paid out. And those months included most of the months that the $600 supplement was added, creating the biggest target for criminals to try to defraud the system. So that's problem number one, it, admit, it omits that. Problem number two is maybe even a bigger problem it omits the elevated improper payment rate under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, the program that was the most subject to fraud. So if you talk with contractors who came after the fact to try to help the states improve their identity verification and improve making sure that that system was paying the right people the right amount of benefits, they regularly say 50, 60, 70 percent of PUA benefits were misspent. So if you're missing that difference between 18.7% average overall and whatever the PUA misspending rate is, the 18.7% is gonna be significantly low. And that's one of the reasons why many people look at the system and say, well, the Department of Labor's Inspector General said $163 billion based on the 18.7% improper payment rate is what we know. The Department of Labor Inspector General was quick to add, it's at least that, given these factors, that the 18.7 is likely a low ball compared right. to what we'll ultimately find, and why many people think that it could end up costing $400 billion in misspending over the pandemic. One more quick question. Uh, some advocate 
for moving to a one-size-fits-all unemployment insurance uh, administered by the federal government. However, the system has been run by the states uh, forever. How does maintaining a system where states lead in decision-making and administration in, of the UI system help American workers and the economy? It's a terrific question. I won't be able to give it uh, proper justice. One of the things is states target benefits to their local labor market and the nature of individuals who are working there and try to match those up so people are able to return to work relatively quickly. Um, one thing that's not has not been talked about very much today is the cost of all this. If the federal government comes behind and forces states to pay ever higher benefits for longer for more people, states will be forced to raise payroll taxes on employers. Um, some estimates suggest that payroll taxes could quadruple if the, some of the forced benefit increases that have been contemplated by some of these proposals were imposed on states, um, especially red states, I would argue, are likely to face the worst of that because those tend to be the places where benefits and taxes tend to be lower. So if federal com government comes behind and says, everybody must raise benefits and, tax and ultimately taxes to this level, the states that proceed from the lowest level will be forced to make the biggest increases and workers ultimately will lose wages because that's where the effect of higher payroll taxes ultimately are felt. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congresswoman Fox. Uh, I now recognize a distinguished member from Georgia, uh, Congresswoman McMahon. Thank you, Chairman DeSonia. Thank you so much for hosting this hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses this morning uh, for your testimony and for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Uh, and I also have read your testimonies. Um, this is a very critically important issue for working people. Unemployment insurance is a promise that has been made to the American people, and it's a promise that we need uh, to keep. And it's a promise that when you lose your job through no fault of your own, that you have something to fall back on uh, as you get back up on your feet. And we know how difficult that has been in particular as we've been coming through COVID-19. Um, you'll have enough to fill your car with gas uh, to make that next interview or take your family to the skating rink. Uh, on kids' skate night, you know, free night. Uh, those are some of the, just the normal things that, that people are looking for to be able to preserve that normal family life uh, while they continue to search for a new job and new employment. Uh, enough to make sure that they are shielding their kids um, from knowing that mom and dad actually are struggling to figure out just how they're going to make ends meet, how they're going to pay their rent, or how they're going to be able to... Um, make a, a payment on their mortgage as that date comes to fruition. As we have discussed in this hearing today, Congress stepped in to support and supplement state UI programs in response to the massive layoffs that we had during COVID-19 and increased economic hardship across the country for so many families. And these programs were enacted by Congress to run through September 4th of 2021 to support working families through the height of the pandemic. However, it's been up to the individual states to choose whether or not they were gonna to continue to participate and how long they would do so. In my home state of Georgia, I'm sad to say that the government and labor commissioner, they made a decision to refuse federal dollars that had already been allocated for these working families in Georgia and they prematurely stopped participating in all the federal unemployment programs that were enacted by the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, including the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation and Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. My question is for Ms. Veronica Robinson. Ms. Robinson, you mentioned in your testimony that you filed for benefits until the PUA program ended in September of 2021. As I mentioned earlier, Georgia, my state, ended the pandemic UI benefits early and in late, of, uh, in late June of 2021. And that actually left months of extended benefits on the table for working families in Georgia that they did not have access to. Can you describe that impact of not receiving the supplemental income on you and your family if Pennsylvania had ended the PUA and other federal UI benefits early? Thank you for that question, Ms. McDonough. Um, that would have affected me in a very negative financial way. Um, I recently, during the pandemic, I recently moved into an apartment 
um, at that time, my son and I, and having those resources and ex for as long as they went up into September of 2021 was a life-saving resource for us. It allowed me to get some furniture that I needed, um, some appliances that I needed that I didn't have at the time when I moved in. And just the ongoing day-to-day -day basis of uh, paying utilities, my rent, being able to buy food, and you know all the basic necessities that you need for day-to-day -day living, um, transportation, um, getting to doctor's appointments, and you know trying to look for work as well. Um, my son is not in school anymore because he's you know he's a young adult. He's just he had just turned uh, 22 that year, but uh, still it made it possible for him as well, his own, you know, uh, PUA that he was getting to be able to put gas in his car that he was able to attain during that time. He was able to get a car to try to do some, um, you know, searching for work and things like that. And just to be taking care of himself as well, which helps me as well and um, contributing to the household. But the overall, just having resources the funds that you needed that you would have had that you wouldn't have if you weren't on the PUA. Um, normally you would be working, but because of the pandemic that happened to everyone, that uh, wasn't allowing most people to be able to work because of the situation. It it would have been very hard. Thank you so very much for your candid honesty. I appreciate it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Wahlberg from the great state of Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panelists for being with us today. Uh, the amount of state and federal spending on unemployment insurance programs in response to the COVID-19 pandemic was us unprecedented. And I would hope that ultimately history will show us that regardless of our good intentions, uh, we made it worse. And hopefully we'll learn that should another situation arise like this, we don't do it the same way and ultimately shut down our world, our country, our business, our government, the way we did. During the 18 months between March 2020 and September 2021, the expanded UI program cost around $900 billion. More unemployment checks were sent out in this 18-month period than were paid out across the six years during and following the Great Recession. A federal response on this scale was necessary at the onset of the pandemic to support hardworking Americans who, through no fault of their own, were displaced from work primarily by what we did and what we said. Now, however, the economy is open again and we have an extremely tight labor market. Every day I hear from businesses in my district who are struggling to fill open, good-paying jobs. So the focus of this hearing should also be on how to better enable workers to move back from unemployment and into the workforce. Additionally, we need to hold accountable those that abused the UI system during the pandemic. Unemployment fraud takes resources away from American workers who need assistance and lines the pockets of fraudsters. Uh, Mr. Weininger, um, DOL's Office of Inspector General noted that during the pandemic, at least $163 billion, as you've said, could have been paid improperly, with a significant portion attributable to fraud. How does this compare with the level of fraud during the years when there is a more minor downturn in the economy? And secondly, did UI systems experience similar problems during the Great Recession? Thank you, Congressman. Um, so typical UI program misspending is about 10%. It varies uh, around that level. Um, in most non-recession years, that's set mostly against state benefits, which are the benefits that are paid um, when there's not a recession or the aftermath of recession. So for example, in 2019, UI benefit spending was $27 billion. 10% would be something on the order of $3 billion in misspending. Significantly, it was very different in terms of the misspending at that point. Much of what in normal years is misspending is somebody get, collects unemployment benefits, they go back to work, and they fail to report that to the system, and overpayment results, and after the overpayment results, much of that money can actually be recovered by offsetting future unemployment benefits or income tax refunds. 
This, as several of the witnesses pointed out, has been a totally different experience where identity fraud and sort of specific efforts, including by international criminal organizations to defraud the system, overwhelmed the system and resulted in some of the huge numbers that we've talked about. So it, it's a difference of kind in terms of what's going on now in addition to a difference of amount. Okay. You, you mentioned in answer to an earlier question that um, the actual fraud could be closer to $400 billion or more. Um, I understand that less than 2.5% of these improper payments have been recovered. What needs to be done to ensure states and the Department of Labor can recover these misspent claims, if right. that's possible? So as I discussed with the ranking member Fox, um, there are a number of things that can be done. Um, unfortunately, I suspect given the nature of the fraud this time, including because much of it Majority, some estimate as much as 70%, might have been driven by international criminal organizations. Much is not going to be able to be recovered. However, there are things that policymakers can do. For the amounts that can be recovered, the system should be geared to encouraging states, which both pay benefits and are responsible for recovering both state and federal misspent money, that they have financial incentives to do that. They don't currently have that. So I referenced legislation that would offer states a 25% bonus of any future pandemic federal misspending that they recover. Currently, if they recover a dollar, they have to send it all back to the feds. This would allow them to keep 25 cents out of that dollar of recoveries and use it to improve their systems and prevent future fraud. Those are some of the kind of things that policymakers could do. So far, they have not done that. So I'm afraid that a significant amount of whatever the ultimate number is, 163 billion, 400 billion, is gonna not gonna be recovered. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. I'm sure now recognize another distinguished gentleman from the state of Michigan, uh, Andy, the floor is yours, Mr. Levin. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman DeSalny, for con convening this important hearing. And in a burst of bipartisanship, I love the 25% uh, idea. You know, unemployment insurance is really one of the most successful government programs since its inception during the Great Depression. It has been and continues to be a vital tool to stabilize the economy and support working families during times of economic uncertainty. Congress stepping in and creating these temporary UI programs to supplement and support the regular UI system helped save the US economy from collapse during the COVID economic crisis. Full stop. It was an extremely important thing that we did, and it helped untold numbers of families. The GAO report examining the UI system is important so that we can conduct our oversight role. However, its findings need to be examined in context so that the UI program can function better and help those in need. I agree that fraud is an issue. We can't accept any amount of fraud and especially in the context of the pandemic-related expansions of the program, we've got to learn the lessons that are there and improve. But that problem is also related to the need for larger and better trained workforce in state after state to service UI, to the need to improve state IT systems, and the need to address racial and ethnic disparities in administering UI. Meeting all these needs requires more investment in the UI system and any attempts to curtail the program would harm working families and harm our economy. Mr. Costa, there've been persistent criticisms about the design of the UI system. For example, because 53 different states and territories each administer their own UI programs and therefore set their own benefit amounts, duration for benefits and other eligibility requirements, this has caused inequality within the system. Can you explain how the current design of the UI program and variation across states has contributed to both declining worker access and to disparities in benefit distribution? Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, first, let me just start by saying there's been a 32% drop in federal funding for UI administration between 2010 and 2019, and that you, you mentioned uh, talking about the, the 
UI systems, the IT systems, that, that drop affects those systems and is what we heard repeatedly from the states. Speaking to the, the eligibility issues, the states can change eligibility requirements. States can define who constitutes a worker. They define who constitutes an employer. So for example, and they, and they also get to define who gets excluded from the system. So uh, students can get excluded from the system. Elected officials can get excluded from the system. But you also have other issues where uh, people who are in contingent work in some states might be defined as workers and in other states might not. Um, that will reduce the, the access for some people to the system because they're, they're not having employer taxes taken and, and, and being paid into the system to provide them that unemployment insurance. Uh, we also found that there were issues with uh, inequities around race and ethnicity, and those varied by state. We weren't able to determine the cause of that. In some cases, it could have been systemic issues, systemic issues around race, or it could be that, that, uh, that fraudsters were targeting specific ethnic or racial groups, or more likely it was both. Um, so a lot of work to be done there. All right, let me try to squeeze one more question. Um, Ms. Dixon, it's my understanding that you participated as one of the stakeholder panelists offering feedback to GAO on how the UI system could be transformed and improved. And one of the observations from the panel noted that funding, as we just heard, has been a longstanding challenge. And in fact, it, was, it decreased by about 32% adjusting for inflation in the last decade. Can you address how the lack of robust U funding for state UI administration over time has weakened the system by contributing to understaffing, the reliance on outdated technology systems, and deficiencies in the agency's ability to deliver timely benefits to claimants, and what should Congress do about all this? Absolutely, staffing is a critical issue in the states, the folks who run those offices, they wanted to get benefits to workers immediately, but they were understaffed and have been underinvested in. These are complex programs, complex jobs, and they require training. And so making sure that they have trained staff, training might take six months, and having to cram all that into one week contributed to the overpayments and the fraud issues that we saw. And also, we want to make sure that technology is, is updated and invested in. Um, when I did a report on technology back in 2013, at that time, the UI systems were, on average, 25 years old. And that oh was my. a while ago. So that kind of gives you a picture of the way we haven't invested consistently across time to improve these systems and to make sure that they can keep up with the claims load and to get benefits paid on time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired. I just would observe that no one in the private sector would allow, consider a company to have a chance to be successful if they relied on 25 or 30 year old IT systems. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we will now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Weddinger, the Department of Labor Office of Inspector General reported in March of uh, 2022 that fraud within the unemployment insurance program has resulted in uh, 163 billion in taxpayer losses. Um, when you put this together with the roughly 84 billion in fraudulent idle loans and uh, 4.6 billion in the PPP loans, which actually received uh, significant underwriting and oversight from the financial institutions throughout the nation. Um, this whole thing looks like it's gonna cost about $250 billion due to poor program, just oversight. Um, I also sit on the uh, House Small Business Committee, uh, which has oversight right now on PPP and IDLE. And uh, what the SBA Inspector General testified uh, to before the committee in January, he said that the OIG, in partnership with the US Secret Service, has recovered 4.2 billion in fraudulent loans in FY20, 2021. Uh, the recovery rate is obviously very weak, um, and I think uh, until we found out that DOL uh, kind of was still working on this, but it only recovered this four billion. Uh, you know, can you tell us? I mean, what what are the things do you see that could be done, or that Congress should be doing, when it comes to other than completely just avoiding SBA direct loans in the future? Um, 
what other things could we do to lower this fraudulent rate that we have experienced under uh, COVID? Well, uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. It, it's much of what you are hearing about and what you read about in terms of fraud in all these programs comes from two combined factors. The pandemic, which was an extraordinary event that disrupted all sorts of stuff, but especially within the context of the UI system, the pandemic alone drove state unemployment benefit payments to levels that states probably couldn't have handled, right? The state systems were breaking down, just trying to pay state benefits in the weeks after the pandemic struck. So from early March, 2020, they went from a roughly 2 million uh, around the country to something like 18, 19 million, just the state side of the system within a couple of months. Then along comes Congress, as I said in my opening statement, with the best of intentions, and airdrops several new programs into the mix and says, hey states, in addition to everything else you're doing, run these programs, providing millions of new individuals that are not known to you, like in the UI side of the house, benefits and make sure that you do it right and make sure that it's paid promptly and all that. So some of the answer, especially going forward, should be if Congress wants to run these sorts of programs, don't plan, don't airdrop them on states and expect things to work out, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Pandemic was much worse than a typical recession, but that only made things all the worse. And that you complicate that with the underlying administrative financing issues that go back, quite frankly, decades in this system and that just makes it all worse. You all are having this hearing after the fact, asking what could we do that would have made things different? And that's sort of a dynamic involving the $2 billion that the Biden administration included in the American Rescue Plan in terms of one-time funds. To fix these things requires enduring long-term attention to make sure that states can do the things you want them to do and pay eligible recipients in a timely fashion and keep the people who shouldn't be collecting benefits away from benefits. Yeah, and I just, I just add, um, what we heard from law enforcement too was, these are some of the most difficult cases to actually track, and they certainly don't have the resources to put forward, uh, because quite honestly, a lot of these applications were online application, a little bit of follow-up, and in some instances, checks showed up out of the blue in mailboxes without having any contact with the person that originally applied for the dollars related, especially in the PPP program. So um, I, I appreciate your comments. I mean, I think, yeah, it's a message for every member of Congress that uh, the closer and the quicker you kind of create a program like this, when there is no oversight kind of at the local level, whether it be state level or working with associations within those states, you're just gonna have to, you're gonna continue to experience this level of fraud. Yeah, and that's also within the bounds of a system where the states really don't have much incentive to guard the door in terms of benefits going out, and certainly no incentive to try to help the feds by recovering benefits on the back end. Very good, thank you. Um, I, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. I uh, now recognize the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate holding this hearing, incredibly important. We're hearing the stories that we all experienced on a local level, and that's the challenges of massive unemployment hitting a system that wasn't designed for it. But we have to remember it was about keeping people alive and making sure they had the basics. So the idea of this hearing is exactly what we should be doing. What worked, what didn't, didn't how can we make it better? And that drives uh, the questions that I'm going to pose. I come from uh, the construction industry. Uh, construction in general tends to be the highest users of the unemployment system by the nature of the work. There are ebbs and flows. You go from one contractor to another, you're laid off. Uh, and we just saw that explode during the pandemic. Uh, throw in uh, self-employed, those folks who never used it before and you just tax the system that wasn't designed. So I think that experience has taught us a lot that uh, when you dealt with state unemployment offices, they were overwhelmed, you couldn't get a hold of people. Um, and I know as part of the, the uh, Pandemic Recovery Act, the IRA, we put quite a bit of money aside for upgrading of the state systems. 
And obviously uh, that is well overdue. But I also understand that there is additional monies put aside to help navigate that system, whether it's those with language barriers or others, that somebody that is well-respected within that group will help navigate the system, particularly when the state unemployment offices aren't there. And we heard the stories of uh, never seeing a recipient um, and those who want to exploit the system. So, Ms. Dixon, I want to talk to you as somebody who has looked at systems. The idea of the building trades in general, creating an entity within themselves, because right now, individual business agents, people from the unions, other, if they happen to know it, they help out where they can. Creating a system of a navigator which there are grants now going to community groups, opening that up to the unions and the building trades so that they will have a trusted individual who understands the system, not only where they're going, the unemployment system, but who is applying those folks from the trades. Have you looked at this? Because in our area, we had a small nonprofit. Literally, that's all they did is help navigate that program for those frustrated individuals who are unemployed and broke. And that in its own way, generically just coming up from the beginning worked really well, but there were still some barriers. Have you looked at that to see how that potentially can be uh, an asset to the system as a whole? So what we know from the research before the pandemic is that workers who were in a union prior to losing their job are more likely to actually apply for and receive unemployment benefits. And one of the critical reasons is because labor unions are deeply rooted in their workplaces. Um, they are deeply rooted in the community. And in this catastrophic situation where there was so much information um, coming at workers, uh, they were able to help them in critical understanding filings uh, deciphering the process, and you know, I would assume also mutual aid, right? In the sense that um, that that is what unions do in other times. And then I would say, you know, it's not lost that they also supported helping get the CARES Act passed to provide this support for working people. So unions are critical in in helping you know folks who they are connected to get connected to these benefits. So, Chairman, I just suggest we might look into this because, A, it helps the surge, which the idea of getting benefits that you've contributed to is exactly what it's designed for. Nobody is trying to gain the system, but it also helps those state unemployment offices because it's usually the member missed something and that hands-on, I think it will bring those stress levels down. And I think looking beyond just community groups, might be a good idea. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. Of course, we always follow your recommendations. With that, I'd like to recognize uh, the distinguished member from Tennessee, uh, Congresswoman Har Harshbarger, for five minutes. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I start by asking Mr. Wattinger, traditional unemployment benefits are financed uh, through workers and employers paying into a UI system through payroll taxes. And I know as a small business owner for 36 years that we've paid our fair share of that. But how were these expanded um, or how were the expanded pandemic related unemployment benefits financed? And the second part of the question is who ultimately pays for misspent and then recovered unemployment benefits? Thank you for that question. So the answer is, the federal side of the system was entirely funded by general revenues. There may have been some you know, residual money from uh, federal trust funds that in the initial days was spent on benefits, but all of the CARES Act and the various other benefits that were legislated by Congress and extended several times were, they came from federal general revenues and they were basically run through the federal trust funds. That all was added to the deficit. So of the $700 billion plus that was used to support federal benefits, the federal pandemic benefits between roughly March of 2020 and September of 2021, um, if 163 billion, 
400 billion, something in between was misspent. That came from federal general revenues and federal taxpayers are on the hook for that. It was all added to the deficit. So, you know, people will, may wish that away, but that money has to be supported somehow, either now or in the future. Do you know how much, or do you have a total dollar figure on how much was misspent? Or, uh, you, you know, I mean, that's, that's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I don't know if we have a number on that, a dollar amount or not, do you? I'm sorry, a dollar amount on what? Oh, misspending. On the mis yeah, yeah um, right. We've, we've discussed that. So the Department of Labor's Inspector General has conservatively estimated that $163 billion of the okay. entire amount, that's the federal and state spending, which is a total of $900 billion or so, $163 billion at least was misspent. However, the Inspector General qualified that by saying it's at least, and what that means is there are other sources of misspending that are not included in that figure. And as I uh, included in my written testimony, some ex experts estimate that as much as $400 billion was misspent with significant amounts of that attributable to fraud. Good Lord. Well, another thing uh, in your written testimony, sir, you stress that individuals should not be allowed to self-certify for eligibility for the UI benefits. And why should unemployment benefit programs require proof of prior employment before benefits are distributed to claimants? Well, because these are precisely because these are unemployment benefits. They are payable to individuals who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. That definition was expanded significantly in the pandemic unemployment assistance program to include people not who previously had a work history and paid into the system, but who couldn't go to work for various reasons attributable to the, to the pandemic. Um, again, those were general revenues that supported those pandemic unemployment assistance benefits. And that's very different from the nature of the regular state UI program that you started out describing where individuals, they work for an employer, the employer pays payroll taxes into the system, every economist mm -hmm. right, left, and center will say that really comes out of workers' paychecks, and that establishes a, a connection and eligibility for benefits so that when the individual is laid off through no fault of their own, they can collect benefits from the system. PUA was an entirely different model in the sense that it was created by the federal government, grabbed general revenues, paid guaranteed minimum benefits to individuals regardless of their prior connection to work and their amount of work in, in many cases, um, and didn't include key features of the regular unemployment system like experience rating and you name it. There's, there's a whole lot that PUA didn't do that happens in the normal course of the UI system. And as my testimony uh, recounts, much of those differences explain a significant share of the openness to fraud that the PUA uh, system displayed. I guess, what, where do we go from here? We know that there's 163 billion, probably 400 billion. I don't know. I don't know. That's a lot of money unaccounted for or fraudulently used. But uh, I know my time's about up, sir. And I appreciate your answer. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Appreciate that. And we're to working with you to resolve some of the issues you brought up. Now, we will recognize the distinguished Member from Michigan, we're going to go back to the Michigan delegation. Stevens, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to our distinguished panelists for taking the questions today. The global COVID-19 pandemic put many of our country's most critical social safety nets to the test, illuminating the invaluable nature of our employment insurance system in preventing economic collapse and undoubtedly exposing some of its flaws. I am a Democrat. I am in the party of jobs and jobs equals people. And so allow me to, to share my gratitude uh, to the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency um, recently getting awarded the $6.8 million grant from the Department of Labor to make it easier for workers in underserved Michigan communities to access jobless benefits. Congratulations. Uh, we look forward to seeing your uh, improvements and continued uh, delivery for Michiganders. Um, workers who have been historically um, experiencing of difficulties applying for benefits, rural and urban areas where residents have had limited internet access, and those with language barriers will be um, benefited by the, the grant to the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency. So, Ms. Uh, Dixon, 
how can the Department of Labor continue to help states remove the technological barriers that certain unemployed workers face, whether due to lack of broadband access or inaccessibility of websites? This was obviously very palpable to me as a member of Congress trying to service my constituents in a host of ways during the, the, the early days of COVID-19. Um, how are we getting in touch with individuals with certain disabilities to ensure that there is equitable access to the UI system? Sure, so I, I think it is, um, I have to say unprecedented the amount of support that Federal Department of Labor is providing to states on these issues. Um, I have been one of the people who's advocated for that for over the years, so it's really good to see that. Um, and it's really good to see the, the funding that Congress appropriated, yet simply updating the technology is not enough. Um, we have long argued that workers are put at the center of modernization efforts, so prioritizing customer-centered design and user experience testing, so not just automating the processes, but making sure that workers can actually access the systems that are being developed, um, and we know that that's what happens in the private sector, which is why we don't have the similar issues when we are trying to access our bank accounts and, and things of that nature. So really making sure that we are taking into account what workers are faced with, that we're optimizing systems for mobile, um, for mobile phones, that we are putting in place ways to reset your password that don't require you to have to wait two weeks in the mail to get a password to get in. So there are fixes that we can do that are more immediate, and then there are the long-term fixes, but all of those fixes need to be focused on making sure that customers can actually use the system and get the benefits. Right, and Mr. Costa, in the GAO report, which was very well done, by the way, so congratulations to you and your team on that, about the implementation of pandemic unemployment assistance um, programmatic efforts, you included findings that there were racial and ethnic disparities in the receipt of these benefits in a few states that uh, were examined in the report. Can you explain what it means, what this means? Um, what does this mean uh, for there to be racial and ethnic disparities in the recipiency rate for benefits? And was the GAO able to determine the reason or reasons for the disparities in the states that it examined, and if, if, if not, why not? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, what that means is that the, the, the percentage of, of people of certain ethnic groups or, or racial groups that applied for loans and actually got through the process, so we heard a little bit earlier about the difficulty of actually getting through the process to make, uh, to, to submit your application, the percentage of people who got through the process and were approved uh, could vary wildly depending on the state you were in. So in some states, the similarities were, were similar, and in other states, they were wildly different. And we looked at four states in particular, and in two of those four states, uh, we saw that benefit approval rates for African Americans, American Indians, and Hispanics were sometimes tw half that of, of white claimants. Um, we were not able to determine the cause of that, but we did recommend that the Department of Labor look more deeply into these racial and ethnic disparities and identify the challenges there and see what needs to be done to address that. Well, thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I would also like to thank Ms. Robinson for her testimony here today as well. I yield thank back. You. We will now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Whitinger, in your testimony, you listed the unprecedented amount of benefits that were doled out during the pandemic. I'm quoting, uh, quote, for an individual consistently collecting the national average weekly unemployment benefit between April 1, 2020 and September 6, 2021, state and federal benefits could reach $46,000. By comparison, the average salary in Indiana is just over $41,000. How seriously did these benefits contribute to inflation and to labor shortages in key industries across the country? Thanks for that question. Um, just for purposes of clarification, the $46,000 was payable over 18 months. I assume your Indiana number is uh, 12 month total. However, the $46,000, important qualifiers, 
It's an average. So individuals that collected more than the average weekly state unemployment benefit, which during the pandemic was something like $325, would have gotten more than $46,000 had they remained eligible for that entire period of 18 months. Plus, it's just one person per household. Many households had more than one person collecting benefits, so multiply by two. Secondly, it doesn't include additional federal support provided during the pandemic, like three courses of stimulus checks, expansions in the child tax credit, expanded food stamp benefits, so you name it. So this is a partial view, but like you said, it compares, um, favorably is not quite the right word, but it's more than uh, earnings from work in many, many cases. A previous uh, member asked me about that, and there are studies that suggest that over this period, something between 40 and 67% of individuals collected more in benefits than they earned from working. So. Um, I'm not an economist, but on the inflation side, no less than former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, Jason Furman, former CEO, CEA chair, um, talked about how especially the, the last course of extensions of these things, the course attributable to the American Rescue Plan after the recovery was well underway and in many states they were starting to get uh, you know, significant labor shortages contributed to inflation. Um, on the question of work, um, I would note that there are um, studies that, that took a look at the question of what happened after states, primarily Republican-led states, but also state of Louisiana, led with a Democrat governor, started opting out of federal benefits in the summer of 2021. Um, a study by my colleague Michael Strain, as well as Harry Holzer and Glenn Hubbard, found that the flow of unemployed workers into employment increased by around two-thirds following the early termination of benefits in those states. So the stated reason by governors and state officials for why the states were opting out of benefits at that point was because it was hampering their recovery, employers were having difficulty finding work, it was contributing to inflation, all of those things. That study suggests that by ending those benefits earlier, states were successful in increasing the flow of workers back into the workforce, which, you know, as you described, is, is uh, something that employers um, often lament about paying people more in benefits, especially than they earn from work. Yeah, thank you for that uh, explanation. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Uh, I'd like to go to Chairman Scott for five minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Whittinger, you, you indicated that the um, increase in claimants was unprecedented. Um, and he also mentioned that the um, pandemic unemployment compensation was a problem. Can you say a word about why it was takes more time to process a pandemic unemployment insurance claim for uh, gig workers, self-employed, or independent contractors than someone that's already employed? Well, so the reason is because the program the individuals who were made eligible for the program were not known to the program before. Obviously, the program didn't exist before Congress created it. The unemployment system, the unemployment insurance program, the state-run program, has been around since the 1930s. Everybody who works in your district for an employer, most everybody, participates in that program. They are in covered work, their employer sends taxes in. When the employer lays somebody off, the system knows them. They know, it knows that the person worked for employer X and the person played, paid in in benefits. The system contacts the employer and says, hey, did you lay this person off? Are they eligible? And the, if the employer answers yes, the individual gets benefits. PUA program was entirely different. It basically made available benefits to a universe of people that were not known to the system before. And so just from a labor intensive point of view, you have to start off with all the information and you have to do them one by one. Those that are already in the system, it's just essentially a keystroke. <clears throat> you know how much they get, you just hit go, and they start getting their checks. So it's much easier to, to process those from before. Um, I, I, if, you, if you can, um, I, I don't know if there's um, a study being done on how we could speed up the one at a time pandemic unemployment compensations, but if you can provide us that um, after the meeting, if you have any ideas on that. Um, Ms. Robinson, I understand that you had received unemployment insurance before and during the pandemic. Can you tell the difference, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between the two 
uh, experiences? Yes, I can, Mr. Scott. Thank you for the question. Uh, the regular unemployment that I received before the pandemic is based on what you get bi-weekly is based on your hourly wage. It's like half of what you normally would get. At that time, I was working a position that was 12 hours an hour. So basically, that's half of that, which is really only $6 an hour. and adds up to be not, not much. So it still made it very difficult to, um, you know, to meet my responsibilities. I, during that time, I tried to get like a little part-time job to help make ends meet, but you still have to report what you make. So basically it keeps me, kept me in the same position of not really having enough still. With the PUA program, it gave you far more than what you were making. So that allowed me to be able to meet my responsibilities a lot more you know, effectively than it did being on regular unemployment because I got far more than what I would normally get. Uh, and the stimulus just only added to the help. It was a life-saving uh, resource at that time. And I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Costin, last Thursday on September 15th, the um, Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration issued a notice reminding uh, state workforce agencies that they must comply with data requests from the department's OIG. Um, the, this is after the OIG cited a lack of direct access to UI claimant data and wage records. Uh, can you say a word about how important it is for the states to comply with the OIG requests? Um, so the, the, the inspector general needs those requests to, to help reclaim funds and, and do investigations uh, as well as uh, analyze the data. So uh, GAO has been supportive of the inspector general's request to get access to that data um, and, and, and think it's important that the states comply with that, sir. Thank you. And did I understand your testimony to say that studies had been done and that there was no effect on re people returning to work when the benefits were cut off, federal benefits were cut off? Uh, we looked at, at 30 different studies, uh, peer-reviewed studies, empirical studies. Uh, 13 of those addressed that issue, uh, and uh, most of those found that there was no effect. Uh, four of those found that there was a moderate effect, uh, usually targeted at specific groups of people. So. Some of the lowest income groups of people in certain areas, uh, like restaurant workers, um, were, there might have been a mild effect. But for most, most people, most, most workers, there was not a noticeable effect. And Ms. Dixon, was that what you also found? That's, that's correct. Um, it is um, one of the saddest things that the narrative that was um, out there about working people with you know, wonderful work ethics was that they were sitting at home um, to collect a payment instead of going to work. And it obscured the other reasons that folks didn't return to work, like lack of childcare, um, you know, worry about catching COVID-19, worry about spreading COVID-19 to their families, and real disruptions in the labor market and supply chains that contributed to you know, slow return to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Um, that is our last uh, questions from um, committee members, other than closing comments from myself and the ranking member. I want to remind my colleagues um, that pursuant to committee practice, materials for sub submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing, so by close of business October 5th of 2022 preferably in Microsoft Word format. The material submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing, please, and only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame. Please recognize that in the future, that link may no longer work. Uh, pursuant to House rules and regulations, items to the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to the 
to edandlabor.hearings at mail.hearings.gov. Again, I uh, really wanna thank our witnesses, all of you um, for your participation, really valuable input uh, from all of you. I appreciate the uh, um, bipartisan constructive comments that I really hopeful that the ranking member and I can work on to improve the system for future, um, future economic downturns and challenges for Americans. Um, Members of the subcommittees may have additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be open for 14 days in order to receive their responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, witnesses' questions for the hearing record, again, must be submitted to the majority committee staff um, or committee clerk within seven days. The questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for a closing statement. Mr. Allen, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too look forward to working with you uh, to continue this discussion and a solution to uh, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, you know, during the 18 months starting in March 2020, uh, as we mentioned, the UI program cost over $900 billion. Uh, during that time, more unemployment checks were paid out than across the six years during the, in following the Great Recession. Uh, this enormous funding enri en enriched fraudsters, identity thieves, and even prisoners. Uh, GAO has rightly put the UI program on its high risk list. So far, DOL's Inspector General estimates that there's 160, 163 billion in fraud. Uh, some experts actually suggest it's closer to $400 billion in fraud. Through the so-called American Rescue Plan, the President and Democrats on a partisan basis provided incentives for workers to stay on the sidelines for another six months. It is clear that flaws in the UI system must be addressed. Decades-old computers, staffing challenges, and new programs resulted in state UI programs that often failed to serve legitimate claimants. It is also clear that these programs are vulnerable to fraud. Less than 2.5% of misspent funds have even been returned to taxpayers. It is a shame that neither, neither DOL nor the DOL Inspector General are here to explain how ARPA's $2 billion UI fund, which is intended to address the program's shortcomings, is actually being spent. Unemployment should only serve as a bridge in between jobs and not be a permanent safety, safety net to stay away from the workforce. Republicans want to ensure the mistakes made during the pandemic are not repeated, and billions uh, more of taxpayers uh, to taxpayers is not lost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I want to again thank the witnesses. Uh, I now recognize myself for closing uh, for closing statement. Um, today, our witnesses made clear that unemployment insurance system is a critical social safety net and for decades it has helped supplement millions of Americans incomes, giving them a critical lifeline during gaps in employment and in times of economic downturn. This is particularly true as we've learned um, during COVID. Unfortunately, the pandemic tested all of us um, at the federal level, state level, and the administration and Congress, and um, consistent with the ranking members' comments, uh, certainly we can come together and I, I really appreciate the tenor of the conversation again uh, of this subcommittee and our members and um, all the witnesses. This is a constructive hearing that I fully expect will lead to enactment um, of both more of the general, the GAO's recommendations, but many of your comments today. So I really appreciate uh, the constructive tone. Um, I appreciate the comments by the Republican witness about saving, keeping money within the system. Um, so that we continue to improve it. I will tell you that I am frustrated um, that this has happened again. Um, and I will specifically say uh, to the state of California, where I put a lot of effort into this as a member of the state Senate and as the chair of uh, the committee of jurisdiction during the recession, 
Uh, one point I brought up about caseloads earlier, uh, that's not to mandate it, but just to inform states about what the right level is. And I also would add one of the things we learned uh, in California Remedy is a single point of contact. I know we hear anecdotally um, of lots of people who are have difficult times emotionally trying to access and going into the system and being lost in the system. So it'd be easier for us to manage. And I'm sure Mr. Allen agrees with this since we both are um, employers uh, in our former careers um, that having a single point of contact and understanding the challenges to ramp up during these difficult times. So with that, um, I really wanna thank again, everybody. I look forward to constructive work product as a follow-up to this hearing. I wanna thank our staffs on both sides. And I look forward to, again, working for uh, an action plan that we can implement with the administration with my colleagues. If there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you all very much.